Hello and welcome to the Ruby Radio Podcast. Whoa! I don't think any of us were expecting this episode, but boy did it entertain. So, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary pals, we've got a lot to talk about, but joining me on the podcast this week, returning once again, the most fantastic and fabulous duo that you can find in this fandom, it is the wonderful Zhao Long and Seni. Wow, that was a big <laughs> intro. <laughs> Such a, we've got so much to live up to now. Yeah, the most I, fabulous duo. <laughs> hey, I think of your, your your status in this fandom. I think it is well deserved, and I'm pretty sure quite a few people listening will agree with me, or at least I hope they do. Um, <laughs> right. So before we dive straight in on this episode, as always, I have to say this: spoilers. This will be going up on Friday. So if you are not a first member, if you have not seen episode 7 of volume 7 worst case scenario please wait 24 hours then watch this unless you desperately want to see spoilers for some unknown reason if not we're gonna go straight ahead you have had your warning so as the titles roll once again and trust love plays which is an absolute banger um i say what did you two think of the episode just generally Oh, I was gonna let you kick this oh, wow, off. Oh, you're so kind. For it. Um, I think I've enjoyed it more having watched it a couple of times since my first viewing. Mm. was a little cold to it. I think I maybe had overhyped what it was gonna be, and I think the fandom had really helped with that one because we had like all just kind of been going a bit wild from last chapter about what might happen in chapter seven, and then chapter seven kind of was like, what? No, that sort of took me off guard a little bit. Yeah, but I think it does. It's more favorable in a second. I think it's one of those chapters where it's more to watch it with the rest of the chapters. I'm hoping that chapter eight sort of like is a nice bookend to it and stands up better when mm. it's seen with the rest of the volume. Like the like the and volume as a whole, here. like all yeah. together. That yeah, even just like the two episodes around it. I think it's one of the ones that is like the sort of weak link. Mm. I was gonna say, do you mentioned it there? Do you think that kind of this isn't so much to blame, but kind of justification on myself. As you mentioned, you there. Like, I think the majority of the fandom is kind of that the fandom got a little carried away. That we had all pictured this dream scenario in our heads for the next episode. And we kind of got ahead of ourselves. That, like, to feel like you're getting ahead of yourself and you think that you know where things are going to go, so it's easy to sort of let your imagination run wild, but that's what, in my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> mm. I was going to say, so once once the intros go, we go straight in. We've got Penny looking extremely sad with the robot, um, which I do like the nice touch of the robot patting her on the head. Yeah, we stand that robot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think you mentioned this in your stream, that all the robots, when Penny's sad, go to comfort her. Yeah. Which I I buy that head cannon. That one that one's adorable. Um, yeah. Us too. And so we cut from Penny being sad to a curfew being in place over Mantle, and we get we get guards trying to arrest people for being out too late. Really sad part is um, from last episode of having two of the thirsty moms sadly perish. We see yeah. two of their kids hiding behind the dumpsters. Yeah. It's sad. It makes me sad because it makes me worry that they're like homeless now. I I not to not to ratchet up the angst, but oh. <laughs> it's a new Ren and Nora. Two orphan kids who've gotta now survive on their own. Oh no, no. I can't believe they brought in the thirsty moms just for angst purposes. <laughs> what do you expect? Did, I was going to say, if we go back to RTX, when Miles said that, do, did any of us think this was going to end up angsty? Like, No. <laughs> I mean, I thought he was talking about Weiss's mum. I didn't think it was a whole gang of thirsty moms. A whole gang of thirsty moms? Is that the, the plural for <laughs> thirsty yeah. moms? A, a gang. gaggle of thirsty moms. <laughs> a a gaggle. gaggle, oh. Um, so we go... <laughs> We go straight from angst to a heist with, um, we finally get to see the happy huntresses in full action as, oh. um, I'm guessing it's wall supplies, repair supplies for the mantle walls, I think, in the truck. I yeah, I believe it's 
supplies that are supposed to be going to Amity Tower, but mm. that they're hijacking for mm. repairing the walls of Mantle. Yeah, because that's what um, Robin said in the previous episode was you out here delivering these to Amity Coliseum in the middle of you know the tundra when it could be being used to fix the wall in mantle and help our people so i think that's what they're doing with everything mm. i i have to admit uh, so we see for the first time we see um may merigold semblance and we see fiona time semblance as they um basically hide themselves from the guards by creating this kind of invisibility bubble and then fiona Okay, I watched this through like eight times now. I'm still trying to comprehend the physics of this. Uh, I don't know what she did. <laughs> she cool. she turns the entire truck, which has got to be weighing roughly about ten tons, into dust, which then sucks into a tiny little portal in her hand. And uh, what? Yeah, I have no idea. What? I would like an explanation. <laughs> like that would be awesome. <laughs> I I I think I like. I think the rough mechanics of it, I understand that, like, any object where she's got enough time and... Because she seems to have to concentrate a little to do it. It, like, it takes a moment to power up, right? I I just... it So it kind of slowly disintegrates like it's being almost 3D scanned, I guess? And then it just... It just sucks into a hole in her hand? Where Where does that lead? Does that, like... I, no I have question. no idea. It kind of reminds me of a black hole when it kind of stretches everything until it's really thin to disappear into the hole. Ah. Instead of it being stretched, it's being like turned into like dust particles. Or, I don't like... know if they're doing that. I just, no, but that's I what it kind of reminds me of. Space. I just don't know where it went. Yeah, <laughs> it's I... went into Janet's dimension. <laughs> the, her void. Her void. Her it's void. gone into Janet's void. But be honest. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, so we cut to a very furious Ironwood in his office, um, where I'm guessing Ruby, Ren, and Nora are giving almost a mission report of what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we also have, so. yeah, uh, we also have Winter and Crow there, and Ironwood is fuming that, um, that Robin is stealing everything from them. Mm -hmm. This was really scary to watch because we haven't seen Ironwood kind of lose it. Like, Mm. he's always seemed kind of like this calm, level-headed kind of guy. This is the first time that we've seen him, like, lose his cool. And that was not cool to see. (laughs) Sorry. Um, (laughs) It's it's interesting because we get the the line from Ironwood, what's more important, getting the world to be able to communicate or a few city blocks... Mm-hmm. And we get Winter, um, I don't think it's Winter suggesting, I think it's probably something Ironwood said before, of enforcing martial law. Which, mm-hmm. if you don't know what martial law is, let's just say it's not good. <laughs> let's, 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 short answer is it's bad. Very, very, very bad. Yeah, I've said it since kind of this started, but it's very like 1984 vibes. Oh, definitely, with yeah. The, the introduction of martial law that just really like puts it more towards that 1984 vibe. And it, I'm scared. Scared. <laughs> scared. This, this scene plays out well because, as you said, we're seeing Ironwood kind of start to lose it. Like... This kind, of, as you said, the calm demeanor, it, it's gone in this scene, isn't it? Totally gone. And, and it's not the worst, we're going to probably see it. <laughs> no, it's probably going to get worse from here. Yeah. Okay, can we leave the angst for two seconds, please? <laughs> two <laughs> damn seconds! <laughs> Sorry. Um, but you are completely right. Like, this feels. Because this is literally the halfway point of the, of the volume, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This feels like the tipping point. This is, and this is kind of, I'd say, Ironwood on the knife edge of which way he's going to fall. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say it, but it's st- he's starting to list very heavily to the not-so-good path. 
Yeah, it's <laughs> not great for Iron Wood's character. No. Not looking forward to seeing what might happen to him, but then I also no. kind of am. <laughs> yeah, like, you know that way when he was talking about how he didn't care about his reputation, like, that's not important. Yeah. And I was like, I understand your standpoint of it, that you don't really care about your reputation because it doesn't matter. But it's, it's going to matter soon because if he's going to open global global communications and then be like by the way there's this like crazy witch lady called salem and she's gonna try and kill us all like mm. everyone's gonna be like mm -hmm, but you sent out a destructive robot that killed people at robin's thing and it's like you yeah. can't prove that it wasn't penny because <laughs> and, so... and and you've left the city that is right below you to perish and die like yeah it's not exactly the best uh, best um, brand logo, is it, to be honest? <laughs> no. no, his PR needs, really needs to hire some new people for his PR. Yeah, he really does need to get new PR stuff. <laughs> yeah. Ironwood, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, I'm currently unemployed. You, you've hit <laughs> me up, details. Um, right, anyway, now that I've given that selfless plug of I need employment, um, <laughs> we get to my fave... I my favorite bit of this scene, and I think a shoe in, it's definitely my joint favorite scene overall of this episode, is Nora, just flat out calling out Ironwood. He have no choice but to stand a queen. <laughs> I, yeah, she gave it to him, didn't she? <laughs> oh yeah. Um. So she goes on this rant of. Um, the people below, they're at the breaking point, they're bearing the brunt, and now you want to send in more soldiers. You cannot just force people to fall in line. Okay, yeah. first of all, Samantha Island nails this. Nailed it. Absolute Total. 10 out of 10 performance, uh, which she's been giving all volume, but she is nailing this scene. And yeah. I mentioned it on my blog, I think, the day before we recorded this, actually. Um... Nora, really, this volume has almost been the MVP. Like, <laughs> like honestly, true. She was the first to call out um, the conditions in Mantle and how juxtaposed they were to Atlas. Within, granted, alongside Blake, within under an hour of getting arrested, she was flat out calling the person who arrested them out in his office. Yep. <laughs> yep. Thunderfies, I need to say no more. Um... <laughs> We've had all the small, like, funny moments and serious moments. We've had her acknowledging that Robin may be a better option, but maybe not doing entirely right. And this scene, where she stares down one of those powerful people in Remnant, arguably the most powerful person in Atlas, who's over, like, 40 centimetres taller than her, uh, in his own <laughs> office, with his two second-in-commands right next to her, and doesn't flinch and stares him down. Not only that... But he is pissed. Like, oh yeah. If, if you're gonna challenge someone that's angry, then you have some amount of guts, and that should be credible, because like, it is not easy to try and stand up to someone who is angry, regardless of, you know, whether mm. you are right or not. Like, it is hard to stand up to someone when they are angry the way that Ironwood was angry. So, like, kudos. <laughs> um. And even, even more impressive is it's Ironwood the one who backs down. Yeah. Ironwood's the one who sits at his desk and looks dejected. Um, at which we then get Ruby backing Nora up, um, mm. saying this is what's playing into Salem's hands. Um, and then we get Crow... Um, not Crow. Use your brain, John. Clover. We get Clover um, giving them a mission report on Tyrion Callows, of which yeah. it's only for the briefest second... But we've got a transcript. I'll throw it up on the screen for you now. Whoever wrote this at Crewby, you terrifying person. Oh my yeah. god. Like, honestly. It's so good. <laughs> but I also have to throw in a Murder of Birds comment on our live stream last night that the redacted is that <laughs> Tyrion was donating money to a local charity. <laughs> the truth will <laughs> out. The <laughs> truth will out. <laughs> um... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to read it fully out. I'll leave it on screen for you to read. But to give it a quick uh, run through, it's a quick, I guess, bio of him and him getting caught by a huntsman called F. Picarell and him getting busted out when he was being taken in a military transport to go to prison. 
Mm -hmm. The most terrifying part is the bit where the um, pilot, who is called Cornetto, yep. Cornetto, um, if you're not <laughs> British, you're not getting that reference at all. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh god you want anything from the shop we just been to the shop i want a cornetto just oh one cornetto <laughs> okay back on track back on track um anyway <laughs> so the most terrifying part with the pilot is the last recorded bit is him repeatedly saying what are you what are you only for him to get killed and the final words on the audio file apparently is Tyrion weeping and then saying beautiful before the transmission cuts. Terrible. <laughs> Terrifying. I hate it. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> so some poor person's final moments was Salem slowly murdering them. Yep. That's... I can't think of the worst way to die. <laughs> slowly melting the ice cream to the ground. <laughs> uh, um... Another bit, this is a, this is a strange bit, um, there's certain parts of it that are redacted. There's a bit in the middle that really, I don't know why this piques my interest. The bodies of redacted were never found and it is presumed they were redacted. However, the second bit that's been removed isn't a simple thing. You'd expect like eaten by Grimm or um, dead or whatever or MIA, KIA, whatever. It's at least a sentence long. Hmm. So does that mean there's some other horrifying way that they can die involving the Grim that Atlas know about? Turned into apathy. <gasps> I what? didn't want to think about that, thank you. Oh god. Wow. <laughs> oh, I've never hated something. Imagine that's that come like out all their bones so like growing and popping. Oh. <laughs> Babe, I'm gonna have to ask you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'm just gonna smash the flipping phoenix right. Hold it on screen right now. Um, <laughs> and so we basically get that he's a psychopathic maniac who, um, with Ruby confirming, he now works for Salem. And we get the Atlas side, let's call it, saying they can't openly tell everyone about Tyrion because they have no idea where he was. That would create panic. We get Nora yep. kick off again. God bless you. Um, bless. And we get Ironwood snap. Yeah, like fully snap. Like he was kind of angry at the start of this scene, but by the end of the scene, he's like not just angry, he's commanding. Oh, it's, yeah. It's danger. Danger mode. We're in danger territory now. This is him laying down the law and authority that I am the one in charge, you follow my lead, you follow my orders. Yeah, like you are not here to make like decisions on my behalf or tell me what to do. I'm the one that makes the decisions and you follow that. Like, mm. <laughs> You we could say he has a an iron will ba -dum -dum for justice. <laughs> I am going I to be using the gif. You. I'm going to use that gif of the ruby chibi grim doing the <laughs> like so many times this episode aren't i anyway yeah you are speaking of orders <laughs> as he turns to leave he says do i make myself clear and winter and clover immediately say yes sir and there's a pause as crow looks a bit annoyed and ruby and nora look down only for ren to say yes sir <laughs> ren who'd been silent this entire time and the look of shock and the look of anger on Ruby and Nora's face yeah. is... <clears throat> it's very interesting. I really do think that uh, there's like an influence from the memory of his dad that's kind of coming into play mm. a little bit. Like, taking it in his stride to be like a man, to yeah. like do what he feels is right. Uh and right now he feels that what is right is to follow mm. Ironwood's orders. And I don't know if it's because he knows the truth of the situation with... Oh, wait, no. Yeah, the truth of the situation with Salem and, you know, the information that they got from the Relic of Knowledge and stuff. Like, I don't know if that's making him anxious, so he's just, like, following orders as he should mm. instead of making it seem like they've got something to hide. 
There's something happening with Ren. I don't know what. What if Ren's the one that tells Ironwoods the truth about Salem? <gasps> oh, he's the snake. Okay, so think. it's definitely once once we get through the episode, it's definitely the first thing we we're going to talk about is Ren. But I, the one yeah. thing I want to point out right now, the main thing I hold is it's very interesting to Ren's path, where yes. Ren has been going, and um, again, I I mentioned this fear. It, Good friend of mine, Sparks Rise. I mentioned her theory last episode, and I've got to bring it back. She's all she's been proven right by this. Is that mm-hmm. she called that? What happened in the um, the election party, Robin's election party, would push Ren further away from Nora. Yeah, because everything he's convincing of himself in his head that they need to fight Salem, they need this plan, they need to be proactive. They cannot just simply squabble in petty politics. That has just convinced him. Yeah, and not only that, like had he been paying closer attention and not been smooching Nora, mm. then he might have been able to jump in and do something. However, which, he didn't see what was happening. Which so is also would... the theory that the Bat Yang gave last. Uh, last episode as well flipping everyone's theories getting proven right here um <laughs> i was gonna say we'll get back onto ren because there's a lot to talk about with him for sure so we slide into the next scene and it's cut to the evening and we've got one of the military transports going through and we've got yang and blake inside as clover quickly says to kind of gives the mission brief to yang and blake as blake looks through uh security cam pictures and mm-hmm. We get them have this conversation of should they have told Ironwood the truth? And we uh, we get Yang once again uh, being that he should know what he's going into. We all should have. And we get Blake not so much say she's wrong, but more in Ironwood's incidents. Maybe it's not the best idea as he's prone to overreacting. And we get this, we get them kind of mutually agree with both sides. And we get, we get Blake lament on how far they're going to have to go to do what is right. The tagline of the episode Mm -hmm. of which immediately we get Yang say that they did what they had to do to stop Adam. Yeah. Okay. Holy damn, this scene was powerful. Yeah. I think it's really... Actually, I'll let you... Since you've done, like, the Bumblebee video essay, I'll let you take this one away. Because you've got good points to make about it. Okay. Well, I just... I thought it was an interesting parallel right away to when we saw in Adam's short for volume six, him and Blake having a pretty serious disagreement on something that Adam had done. But instead of Adam owning up to it or like them talking about it in any kind of reasonable way, he immediately made it Blake's issue and gaslit her and guilt tripped her and made it about her parents. Like he just took absolutely no responsibility and totally manipulated the situation so that Blake ended up being the one that felt guilty and responsible for something that Adam had decided to do. Um, and obviously Yang takes the complete opposite approach. And again, it's just showing like how different she is from Adam, despite some very small similarities. Mm-hmm. I, I the, yeah. This this scene, uh, as you said, it, sh- it shows how they're foils of each other, how Yang and Adam are these opposites, yet they do have certain similarities. And... As we mentioned um, before we start the podcast, we were talking about we'd all expected something different from this episode. Of that we we were all expecting the we were expecting the nightclub, weren't we? Yeah, we were <laughs> expecting the nightclub. I'm not mad about what we got, but I, I wanted to see them dancing in the nightclub. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm honestly going to say it though, because uh, at the time I wanted it. I wanted it right up to the episode. Looking back at it. I am actually more glad we got this scene. Me too. Because for one, it's... We're going to go into it a bit more in a moment with the next part of it, but it is very emotionally powerful. And second of all, looking back at it, like... Uh, as You mentioned this, um, Zhao Long, like, if you played it through, going from a massacre at a political rally to suddenly, oh, goofy hijinks in the cinema, we're dancing, oh, look at this, it would have been mm-hmm. a bit of a... 
bit of a weird tone shift, wouldn't have it? Yeah, it would have been a really strange tone shift. I'd agree. Like, because we know if if we'd got Weiss, Yorn and Oscar at the cinema, it would have just been comedy. Like, yeah. nothing else. Like, that's what it would have been. Um... So we get this, and it morphs into this conversation about doing what they have to do, and they did what was they did what was necessary to beat Adam. Mm-hmm. Um, we get Blake with uh, this line, uh, but next time I want to make sure we don't have to. And I can tell you, ambushing a huntress who's just trying to do what's uh, trying to help is an option I'm thrilled about choosing. Okay, this multiple things to break down. In this first of all, the fact that. This is the definite proof that I I don't know why this keeps going around the fandom so much of all oh, the bees didn't have to kill Adam. <laughs> this is literally the proof it is of the that they had no choice. It was the final option. It literally said to him, "I'm gonna die on this fucking hill." <laughs> yeah. Just like Adam. Yeah, I will die on this hill. But he, they gave him the option to walk away. They were like, "Walk away." We don't need to deal with this anymore. Just you go have your life. We'll have our life. Let's just mm-hmm. like never cross paths again. He didn't take it. He backed them into a corner and gave them no choice but to do what they did because of course they want to live. If you were put in a situation where you had to fight for your life, of course you would fight for your life. Like, mm. oh, that's just dumb. That's mad dumb to think that... Like, if someone else was in that situation with Adam, that they wouldn't fight for their life. They would just let themselves be killed. Like, don't be so... <sighs> don't be dumb. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> it's... And the the point of they don't want anyone more, anyone more, anyone else to die. Even if it's an enemy, they don't want to have to be forced to take that option again. Well, yeah, like, they didn't become huntresses to murder people. Mm. They became huntresses to protect the people. In a way, they were protecting the people by getting rid of Adam. But that wasn't what they came here to do. Yeah. And... Oh, oh sorry, you were going to say. But obviously, like, Robin at Hill is pretty different from Adam. Like, she might be what you would term a vigilante, but she's not actually, like, trying to physically hurt people as of mm. yet. No. Like, it is just petty crime. She's just stealing government resources at the moment. She's not trying to blow up schools or anything like that exactly and the only reason that she's like stealing atlas property is because she doesn't see what's so important about the amity coliseum because when she saw clover clover said that they were just giving it its yearly checkup so why does it need so many resources you know, for a no that's actually checkup? pretty interesting something i just thought about now is like i wonder if like does he elements of adam and even robin obviously robin does seem to be just a better more grounded person but maybe she sees what could be a potentially destructive path starting to open up for her and that's maybe another reason why she was like no we need to like try and reach out that's an interesting thing to think of yeah i appreciate that standpoint because it's it's interesting i like it i I was gonna say directly from what you literally said there is we get blake in the same mindset of robin isn't the same as Adam and I don't want to be fighting her. She's trying to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Which, again, as we mentioned earlier, Nora literally spelled it out for us in uh, literally last Mm -hmm. episode when she said that Robin's trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And this is my favourite bit is you see Yang ponder for a second and then say then maybe we shouldn't. And immediately we get Blake perk up and they uh, they turn to look at each other as the camera uh, goes away. Yeah. I really appreciated that because like Yang could have been like, yeah, I appreciate your standpoint. However, we've got a job to do, so we just need to do it the way that we're seeing Ren and Nora go at the moment, where mm. Nora's got a way that she sees things and Ren's like, yeah, but we're here to, you know, do our job and obey rules. Ren's not even like that. Ren's just like straight up doesn't even consider the other options. He's just like no, no, <laughs> but it was nice to see the communication. Yang consider the different, yeah, yeah. the open communication to you, consider you, different options. You mentioned Ren now. I was literally about to bring this up. We're getting. We've always had parallels between Renora and Bumblebees. It's been going on for quite some time now. Um, mm. And one of the interesting things with Renora right now is the lack of communication. Ren, whilst Ren 
personally acknowledges he's never been one to be talkative. He is flat out refusing to to open dialogue with Nora, much to Nora's immense frustration. Meanwhile, you've got the mm-hmm. bees at the opposite end of the spectrum of they are communicating and talking to each other. And what really made this scene for me is I've seen so many shows, especially in animes, where you get a scene like this and it's either one person's right and the other person isn't or both people get ultra angry and very defensive on their sides. Yeah. To see a scene where they both negotiated out, they saw the reasoning points of each other and they came up with an idea between them to fix it, mm-hmm. it was great. That's also more realistic to what a true healthy relationship is like. Mm. Not to say that Renora is currently unhealthy, they just need to talk. But like a truly healthy relationship is when you maybe don't see eye to eye, but instead of being like, well, you're wrong and like arguing with each other, it's like, okay, well, if you don't think I'm correct, what's your stance on it? And then you talk it out and then you figure it out from there. Compromise. Compromising. (laughs) It's very important. Mm. Um, I will also note that throughout the scene we get a piano version of Trust <laughs> Love from the intro playing. Yeah, it's so soft. Once can... again, <laughs> Jeff Williams and the rest of Kruby who work on the soundtrack, that is, it's one of the best pieces, uh, instrumentals I think I've heard yet. Like, of the redos. I mean... Do you not remember Be Hot? <laughs> I, I know, but of like a different thing. Like Behar no, is, yeah, Behar is great because it's this very upbeat, haha, but it would never really fit in with the show. <laughs> this instead of that soft piano, it was just Be Hot. It was just it's not even called Be Hot, it's armed and ready. Cause... We yeah, all know it is Be Hot, come on. Like... I know. <laughs> Could you imagine how different that scene would be if it was Be Hot? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I kinda wanna buy it. I me- I think I mentioned this last time you're on the podcast. I kind of want to buy a banjo just to learn that one song and play it at RTX. Real, you should. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. But yeah, I really did like the the piano sort of. It's so soft. Interlude Could have, with like, it. melted listening to it. Me too. <laughs> Me too. It was just so soft. It was the exact kind of music that was necessary for that scene. Mm. Yeah, and even the way that they framed everything in that scene, like from a sort of cinematic point of view the fact that they chose such like extreme close-ups of their expressions when they were like looking at each other it's just like it again just shows you there's a closeness Mm -hmm. and a trust to their relationship that is different with how they are with the other characters yeah and as we were talking about on the live stream last night about the importance to blake of eye contact so they they showed that even more with the close-ups of the eyes so that when they were looking at each other, it was very obvious that it was eye contact because that's how that's Blake Blake's established best way yeah. to trust, trust someone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I just thought it was wonderful. The the next scene we get uh, Ruby Weiss um, watching a I'm guessing dormant Penny. She's in like a shutdown mode as like her yeah. data is being analysed in Pietro's workshop with hmm. Pietro and Maria. Is finally back. Maria! We've missed Woo! her so much. Um, and we get Pietro lamenting that if Penny hadn't have been able to stop them, Robin would have been dead. And we get Ruby and s- were, has already worked out that once again, Penny was the target. That they knew exactly which buttons to push. Yeah, exactly. It's the same way that they chose Pira in season three mm. as the target because she was like, you know, the sort of prodigy. She was the invincible girl. The invincible girl. She was yeah. amazing, great at combat. She already had like a good history before she made it to Beacon. And then they totally like tore that whole future apart for her. <laughs> well, and <laughs> Penny. And Penny. The, the, they, God bless. Once again, yeah. it shows that they pick their targets very well like very well the the i want to mention this briefly i think uh, again i think this was mentioned in your live stream last night which by the way um I, we haven't got to the plugs bit but yo go check out the live streams on the weekends do it um, thank you please don't, <laughs> please don't hey eddie revas was there last night murder of birds was there last night yo go check it out it's a party um <laughs> thank you and uh, i forgot someone mentioned it i think in the comments um 
of how good the bad guy schemes are. Like, Watson Tyrion is this terrifying tag team, but yeah. their plan is you don't want to see it succeed, but at the same time, you want to see what they're going to do next. I think it was Shark Boy that was actually talking about it in the live stream. He was rooting for the villains because he... their plans are so good. Yeah. yeah. And that's what makes good bad guys. You want them to win because mm. then it makes them more formidable and honestly like i didn't see what's and Tyrion working well together i thought that was going to be all kinds of a train wreck but they have surprised me and i'm really impressed by what they're able to do together i'm just gonna say who would have expected that the ugly stepsisters framing pinocchio for murder would be so good whilst mulan and um four make out the <laughs> background <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Ruby. <laughs> wow, Ruby really is something. Um, so we get Pietro saying how it's got to be surely the same person from the Fall of Beacon who's getting through our systems as it would be child's play for them to get through the mantle security. But yep. luckily, Atlas runs on a different network and he says, uh, Weiss asks him who has access to that network and he says, oh, only the top officials. Um some people work in sub-security, and most importantly, a select few who oversee critical systems like the sewage and heating grid, and immediately Weiss has figured something out. Weiss is suspecting her family as she knows the Schneed Dust Company is directly involved in the heating grid. Yep. Uh, Schneelock Holmes. Schneelock Holmes. You got it. Schneelock Holmes. Um... <laughs> This has got to be a heavy hint that Weiss is going to do some sort of investigation into her father, be it with her team or alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what better chance to do it than, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> you, you, you're, thinking, you're thinking quicker than I am. I'm jumping ahead. I'm sorry, but yep. <laughs> we get Pietro saying how grateful he is to Maria for helping him because of how this has been so hard, which he's had to watch his daughter get framed for murder and... People adamantly talking about destroying his daughter. Yeah. That's not exactly unstressful for someone who's been shown to be quite ill. Yeah. And, and not only that, he's such a nice person. Like, he just, from the good of his own heart, like, created Penny, like, with the purest of intentions. Mm -hmm. um, and to see that his pure intentions have been framed for mass murder and people want her to be deactivated that must be heartbreaking and we get ruby say maybe you shouldn't worry as much i mean you can just reactivate penny anytime you want and we get pietro give us a uh, turn away and say penny is the only one of a kind for a reason and he shows us a photo of which is him and four of the scientists um and saying how when they were asked by the general to come up with a new defense technology, he decided to look inward. And basically, he gives the story of how the Penny Project came about. Okay. Yep. First thing in this picture, he's covering someone with a yellow turtleneck mm. with his thumb. Hmm. I wonder who hmm. this could be. Hmm. Well, also, you'll see in my reaction how I reacted to that. <laughs> <laughs> also, was I the only one who got Power Rangers vibes from this science? like science team picture oh, blue green you know, red black yellow yeah see i didn't think about it until we did the live stream and everyone was like yeah power rangers and i was like oh my god um, what says the yellow power ranger confirmed confirmed <laughs> and so we get him saying how he's surprised that ironwood accepted he accepted the penny project over any other but how happy he was and we get this bit of him saying, much to my surprise, it was selected. And Weiss go, why are you surprised? You're the first person to create an artificial aura. And here we have, I'd say, the big <laughs> shocking moment of the episode. Yep. Degree. Is Pietro reveals that, in fact, he gave part of his own aura to bring Penny to life. Yep. And we see him... Which is just... Heartbreaking. Yeah. 
it's like it's like when you actually have a kid in a way like obviously i've never had kids but i can only imagine from parents that i've seen that absolutely adore their children like you do give kind of part of yourself to your kids um mm. so this is like a nice visual to show that like that is truly his daughter because he's passed part of him to create her and to part give her a life <laughs> part of his very soul yeah heartbreaking okay so he also goes on to say that every time he re- has to rebuild penny he has to give a bit more and so he's lo- he's slowly running out of aura yep. and he's which, sick which so. <laughs> I, I think heavily that maybe the reason he is sick is because his aura can't fully protect him yeah because yeah. we are dealing with somewhere that is basically the Siberian wilderness, northern Canada, the Antarctic. Like, we're not exactly dealing with a warm climate here. <laughs> so, as he puts the photo back down, he takes his thumb away, and we get revealed that the yellow uh, turtleneck-wearing scientist is a younger Watts, who is already looking very sinister and very angry. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that he maybe had, like, a different idea that he thought would be accepted mm. um, and that he felt not ashamed, but he was angry that um, his genius was not being recognized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that it went to some like robot chick. Like why wasn't my amazing thing recognized, but this robot girl has, uh, it's just stupid. With Pietro, the Pietro saying that he literally gave part of his aura to bring penny to life there is several things that come off this that i've thought up all which are laden with angst so buckle up because we're gonna go oh. straight through them now first of all hell yeah if penny okay if penny is to be destroyed we are willing to bet that pa if pietro is still going he will try to sacrifice himself to bring penny back right 100 percent, absolutely okay next one if pietro is not around and penny's dead Every single nuts and dolt shipper. Here's a fantastic idea for a fanfic: Penny, uh, Ruby, giving part of her aura to bring back Penny. No. no. Okay, you want more? Because trust me, I've got more. I've thought of way too many, and this is sure the <laughs> this is the main one that I've come up with. Okay, let's hear it. It's directly from this that Pietro is either the first person ever or is someone who has done a lot of research in how to split and take away auras from people. So surely he's either got to have helped or been the mastermind behind the aura transfer machine that they tried to use on Pera. Yeah, I'd assume so. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Because surely that's the way he gave his aura to Penny, right? Yeah. And also, you'd imagine the bit that really tips it for me in this idea is if you look in the group picture, what's the thing behind Pietro? I saw this. It's the aura transfer. It looks like the the aura transfer chamber. Yeah. None of this spells good, and there's now about 90 red flags flying around Pietro at all times. (gasps) New theory. Go for it. What? What if they put Penny in the aura transfer with the Winter Maiden? Oh. And shook her aura. Yeah. (laughs) Right over. Oh, damn. (laughs) Yeah, because Penny's proven that she could... Would she get the Maiden powers, though? Would it go to... Yeah, because she can take an aura. So, Oh, this... This has brought me so many questions. I'm having an existential crisis trying to figure this all out. Um... (laughs) Right, we'll we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this. Moving on to the next scene. So, we get the happy huntresses trying to go through another heist. We get May going almost blind as the truck beams her with its headlights. Um, And we get Robin open the back, only to be extremely stunned by a cat girl and a cyborg standing there with their hands up. Um, (laughs) Yep. Uh, which... A cat girl and a cyborg. <laughs> I'm not wrong, am I? Come on, let's. No. All right. So, I, I would like to point out, I do love Yang, Yang and Blake with their hands up, just go Robin, and totally didn't expect her to run away. Like, come no. on, what do you think she's gonna do? So 
we get yeah. Robin. Robin turns to Happy Huntresses, tells them to scramble, and the bees chase after, saying, "No, wait." Uh, we get Blake was the bit from the leet clip. Um, <laughs> we get we get Blake swing across the traffic to give chase, and we get this very brief but really kind of cool fight scene. Yeah, loved it. Loved seeing the Bumblebee maneuver against Robin too. I don't think she expected that. She mm. didn't expect it. <laughs> no. So we give Blake first giving chase, and also to every single Bumblebee cowboy AU. You just got fuel there with Blake using Gamble Shroud like a lasso. Come on. Yeah. Um, so we get Robin, <laughs> Robin try to avoid her and then retaliate. And then we get Blake say, come on, stop. We just want to talk. And we come to this great little combat piece. And we get Blake using her semblance offensively again. Finally. Oh. Finally. Yeah. Like I was so happy to see that again because the way that she used that against Roman in season two was just magnificent. Peak. Oh yeah, it was just exquisite. Because we so. we we see her use a semblance normally, but we know that depending on what she's got loaded into Gamble Shroud, she can use different types of dust to do different sort of things. The only ones I believe we've seen so far are ice, earth, and fire. I don't believe we've seen uh, enough. Yeah. One. No, I don't think we have. We I think that's all. Because we did talk about that. What what would happen if you launched a gravity dust one? In? Yeah, would it just like launch Robin into the air, or would it like suspend her midway? <laughs> can, can, well, for a second, we get a like a flaming Blake, right? As the real Blake disappears Spoke behind. Up. Yeah. <clears throat> lightning Blake. Ooh. Learn Sweet. from Nora. Give us lightning Blake. Um. But anyway, so what we... would happen if you loaded lightning dust into Magna Hilt? Thunder go by Finn them. Lizzy is playing somewhere in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would put that in the podcast, but I'm 200% sure I'd get copyright striked. No. Um, yeah, nope. <laughs> so we get Robin get knocked back by the explosion as um, Blake bounces away, only for Yang to throw herself off a roof to try and bear hug um, Robin into submission and as you said we get this fantastic bit where they fantastically team up, we get Yang bounce off Gamble Shroud so they're fighting either side of her to put Robin on defensive we get the Bumblebee move and this time instead of it like being a swing move it's kind of like a um, almost like a slingshot of Yang pulling Blake in so that she can full on kick Robin backward Mm -hmm. and with a gap in the fight we finally get them talk, and Robin say, I'm always going to have to send uh, a little bit more than some kids if he wants to take me down. Which I'd like to point out, Robin, you were losing then. You were losing <laughs> then to two kids, so... You, you were can... losing. You were yeah. losing. Sorry, I'm losing my accent. <clears throat> um, so, we get this bit, and we get the bees in see He is. The other hunter, huntsmen and huntresses are on the way. We need to talk to you. And we basically get them lay out to Robin what's happening. Of which we also get a nice little bit of Blake pauses, unsure whether to fully say the truth. And Yang kind of gives her a reassuring nod as she continues. Yeah. And the eye contact again, very important. Mm. And we get... Rightly so, Robin is immediately suspicious. Of which also, I love Robin's nicknames for people. We've had Five O'Clock Shadow, we've had... Um, Squeak. Uh, Pip squeak. We've now got fisty cuffs. I I do yeah. love them. Um, and Meryl was wags, and wags, as you pointed out. I love that. And we get to see a semblance for the first time of the if it's a lie detector. Brilliant. Which again, I I know. I think you guys predicted this. I think Murder of Birds predicted this. I think I'm trying to remember. Another big YouTuber predicted this. I, we predicted on the well. We mentioned similar ideas on the podcast. Of that, mm-hmm. her semblance was something to be like this. Yeah. So the way it works is she has to make, I'm guessing, skin contact. Yeah. And she'll ask the questions, and then her arm will glow green if it's correct. I'm guessing red if it's wrong. Um, I remember I put the other day: green light means go, red light means fight. Um, <laughs> I like it. We we give Blake give out the truth, and Robin is very stunned by this. Of yeah. which, Yang, now is not the time for puns. As funny as it was, now is not the time for puns. Um, 
of we get her mansion handy semblance. Um, which, by the way, we had confirmed on Jiao Long and Sunny's stream that Eddie Rivas himself confirmed that that was his joke. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Because I know that uh, in season one that a lot of Yang's kind of funny moments were ad-libs that Barb put in there. But I liked that confirmation that it wasn't an ad-lib, that it was part of the script. Because it just... Mm. Nice payoff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was cool getting to hear that bit of info in our stream. Yeah. So as we get... Um, Bumblebee basically try to explain to um, Robin what's happening. We get Robin asking a lot of questions, wondering what is it? And most importantly when they mention there's another group in Atlas who are framing Ironwood, she wants to know who they are. Before of course. they're cut off by Harriet interjecting on the uh, earpiece communication with Yang, saying where are they? And they say they've got to go, which I do love Yang cutting off Robin from saying bullshit. Um, yeah. I do love that. It's grapes or nothing, all right? That's that's all we're having. <laughs> um, and we get what I find the most, the one of the two most powerful lines in this. Look, we are trusting you, so trust us when we say etc, etc. Yeah, this whole season is very heavily about trust, and I really like trust that. Trust love. Trust no. love. <laughs> it is, though. It really is about who to trust. Yeah, and making sure that you put your trust in the right people. Mm. And so we get Robin disappear back into the shadows as the bees try to head off the out security by saying that Robin got away. There's an interesting... Which I wonder how they'll take it. Mm. I, I, I it'll, don't know it'll... if they'll believe them. Again, it'll be interesting <laughs> if we see the fallout of this or if they'll just be able to blow it off easy and it'll just be something that's not brought up. Yeah. There's an interesting thing I want to point out with the positioning of the characters and the lighting, which again is a shout to Kruby of how amazing they're always being. I es loved this for Lighten. Especially with what happens in the next scene. So I'm going to briefly mention it here and I'm going to come back to it. Robin, once she's knocked back by... Blake, she's in the darkness. And mm. when Yang and Blake present her the truth, she steps into the light. And when she sw says she wants to sit, she will not stop until she finds the truth, she disappears back into the shadows. Yeah. I also really like that when uh, Blake and Yang knocked her back, she didn't actually fall completely into the shadows. She, she fell into the light and then scurried back into the shadows, mm. which is a nice little detail. So keep that in mind, listeners, as we go into the next bit. So we go to a scene I don't... I, I So maybe some people might be able to call out the other scenes. We definitely knew the Robin scene was coming. Mm. I don't think anyone would have predicted that we would have got a scene inside the vault. So we cut to Ironwood with Oscar inside the Atlas Vault, which is this kind of... Um, Gray, gray floor with this weird, almost ray structured blue lighting lines for it. It reminds me a lot of, um, is it the Promethean ruins from the Mass Effect games? Yeah, very similar actually. And we got these uh, ice blocks suspended, and interestingly, the door for the relic is a good twenty meters past the end of the platform, about ten meters up in the air. So maybe there's some sort of ladder that appears to get to it, I wonder. But we'll find out. We'll, we'll find <laughs> Just yeet. <laughs> like Bumble. <Yeet. laughs> um, and so we, we have Ironwood saying he brought Oscar down here to try and jog some memories. And we get the interesting bit that Ironwood reveals that it was Ozpin who used the staff of creation to um, bring Atlas into the air. And that it's not actually gravity dust that keeps it floating. Yeah, that's just the public story. And we also get the limitations on what the staff can do. Of that it can do... It can create seemingly anything, but only one f one purpose at a time. I'm guessing the downfall is the minute you try to make it do a new purpose, the old one goes away. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of... I never know how to pronounce her name. But the creation girl in My Hero Academia. Oh, Momo. Like she can create... Yeah, she Just can more. create anything, but it takes her a while to create it. But mm. she can't create, like, this thing and another thing at the same time. It has to be this one thing or it's the other thing. And there's yeah. a limit to how much she can create. So it kind of reminds me of that. Momo, you're the best girl. 
You're so sweet. Love you. Um, <laughs> I just show my My Hero Academia preferences. Let's carry on. Um, <laughs> surely the biggest hint we've got of how Atlas will now crash. Yes. yes. Hell yeah. As soon as that was mentioned, we like looked at each other because that's in our box of predictions. That's one of the only ones that I remember is in the box of predictions is that Atlas is going to fall. I, I was going to say when, when I had you on the podcast before the volume started, I don't know if it was both of you. I definitely know it was yours, Xiao Long, prediction yeah. <laughs> that Atlas will crash, be it this volume or the next. Yeah, yeah. I, I see it. This is the most likely followed by the Amity Arena crashing into it. I see those are the two Ooh. most likely. Um, Something's gonna fall. <laughs> so, so we get Ironwood saying that he just wish he could ask um, Ozpin, and we give Oscar say, I can't say what Ozpin would say, but I can say what I would. And he gives him this advice of, he basically says, it, it's strange because we know that this is what Ozpin does, uh, has done, but Ironwood doesn't. But he gives the advice of, don't do what Ozpin did. Don't go down the path where you're the only one you trust. And you convince yourself that you're right. Yeah. Which is good advice from a little boy. <laughs> Sound advice. Oh, yeah. yeah. From a 15, 14, 15 year old, that's a hell of a lot. Hell, hell of a good advice. Um, yeah. That kid's going to be so depressed when he's older. <laughs> <laughs> he had to grow old before him time. Okay. I mentioned the lighting in the last scene. This yeah. is why it gets really interesting for me when you bring it into the scene straight after. So... Mm. In this, we've had the main sort of glow of light coming from the door. We've had Ironwood right in the sort of light of it. And when Oski gives his advice, he walks alongside him. And Ironwood kind of looks up at the door, scowls, and turns away from the light to leave. Yep. With him saying, we have to stop Salem, nothing matters more. And as he goes to cross the little bridge between the platform and the elevator... We get Oscar, who's still in the light, turn around and say, some things matter more, I think. Um, mm. It's about keeping our humanity. That's what makes us different. And as he says this, Ironwood stops, listens, and when he's finished, carries on walking into the darkness. No. no. <laughs> he's being burdened by his own mind. That's why he's walking into the dark. Mm. And so we... The end of the scene we get we get close out is we get Ironwood asking Oscar as Oscar walks towards the elevator, do you trust me? And mm -hmm. we get the line from Oscar, I do, but you're not the only person I trust. And maybe what you need to do is talk to the people you're most afraid to talk to. Of which yeah, we yeah. get Ironwood kind of give a little chuckle and say, now you're sounding a lot like Ospin. Okay. Jo real side thing is mm -hmm. this showing that despite the fact Ozpin's not something directly in his head right now not directly talking to him the process is starting to happen process of Ozpin of him becoming part of the Ozma collective <laughs> Oz <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know what it is. it is come on it is that like that's what it is um <laughs> This is something I have to consider every single time we have a discussion <laughs> journal. Like, I swear, every time that Kelly has something that she thinks of, it's like, this is who I'm marrying. <laughs> 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 this is what I gotta deal with for the rest of my life. I'm grateful. It makes me laugh, but gee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I'm actually crying. Rest of my life. <laughs> I'm actually crying. Oh, oh, hang on, give me a second. Oh, <laughs> Jesus <your> Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I've completely forgot what we were talking about. Osmosis. <laughs> osmosis. Stop saying osmosis. <laughs> Never. <laughs> okay, okay. Whew, calm, relaxed. Right, so, um,. Yeah. So, so is this Oscar becoming as what Xiao Long would call it the osmosis? <laughs> like, is, is because you don't know it because Oscar has grown up so much this volume in the last volume. We see him mature so much, and him saying last volume, "I want to do everything I can," and we've shown him to be—he's been shown to be extremely intelligent, way ahead of his years. 
Mm. And it's the question of, is it because of everything he's gone through and he's learned? Or is it because he's got Ozma, Ozpin, all the other reincarnations in his head? Mm. It's a really interesting point uh, to bring up, to be fair, because obviously like, we didn't realise when we knew Ozpin as just Ozpin mm. um, to, to have like a voice in his head that was kind of advising him on what to do. So maybe like that's just an early days kind of thing to get the gist of what's happening mm. and then after that it's just kind of the voice goes the voice goes and then it's just your decisions mm. so, so of course it can't be a ruby volume 7 episode without some angst to finish off with so here we are um we as yes. they come out the elevator we get winter pacing and penny looking very upset which very is fully sad. understandable and we get Oscar and I would enter and they ask what's wrong and Winter hands over an invitation. It's from everyone's favourite a-hole in Remnant, Jacques Chenille, who's invited them all for dinner. Lovely. Where Ironwood... So kind of them to invite them for dinner. <laughs> where Ironwood is going to have to defend his seat on the council. Mm-hmm. Oh boy, we've got some fun to look forward to next week. Yeah. Honestly, all I can think of is that meme with uh, the blonde white woman, like, screaming and crying, and then the cat just, like, looking past its salad, like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's the meme. And that's it. basically going to be Next the episode. whole episode. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> whew, we've got a lot of different things to talk about through this. Yeah. However, yeah. the main one... It has to surely be Ren, right? Ren's got to be mm. the... Because that moment from Ren was... I I wouldn't say it was out of character for where he is in this volume. It's very much in character. It's... I just don't think anyone was expecting it, were we? Like... Um, I wasn't, certainly. Were you expecting no, it? No, he seems to be on a path. A very yeah. slippery, slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, we were watching all of the episodes through with... Um, with Kelly's sister over the weekend because she's only seen up to episode two. Mm. Uh, and the whole time that we were watching it, she was like, what is wrong with Ren? And we were like, bruh, <laughs> we all know. He's just doing him thing. Mm. <laughs> there's there's a fantastic point that was brought up, by, uh, brought up on Twitter. I'm going to throw up the screenshot now. I'm going to put a link to um, this. I'm going to say your username wrong. I'm really, really sorry. KOC? K- K- Kowasi? I'm, I'm, I've said it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm just going to roll with it. Um, and but what they say is Ren's reaction lies here in the dialogue with his father in Volume 4, which you see in that flashback back then. Ironwood is the only one with a plan to fight Salem. Even if the plan is flawed, even if the plan is bad and cuts so many corners and hurts so many people, it is action. And it is yeah. taking action, whereas the other side is taking no action at all, which directly cuts back to what his dad says to him. Sometimes the worst action to take is taking no action at all. Yeah. I think that's oh, nailed it on the head. Childhood trauma. Childhood trauma. Oh, <laughs> childhood trauma. Right through adult life. <laughs> childhood trauma, which is in bucket loads in Ruby. I mean, does Watch. anyone in the main cast not have childhood trauma of some kind? I mean... In- I guess technically in a way Blake it was just guilt that she left but she didn't have childhood trauma with her mama mama <laughs> yeah but <laughs> then she dad. then she then she had like ages through she made 12 up for her with her teens. <laughs> yeah 12 through 15 <laughs> like uh, yeah. and Oscar's going Never through mind. something the only one really is probably <laughs> yeah. Sean like Sean's probably the only one and he's now had to deal with a dead teammate and having yeah. a mental breakdown mid fight well i suppose childhood trauma for him was still in his teens when pira died that's still childhood trauma right he was in school <laughs> they 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 all need a hug someone give him a hug um someone needs to do them through therapy <laughs> they need some so it's in some as you mentioned earlier it could be ren the one who um excuse the very british phrase but dobs them in uh, who yeah. tell who tells Ironwood the truth? Because everyone presumed it'd be a lot of people said it would be Oscar at the start because he was the one closest. Now a lot of people are saying it's Ren. Yeah, I feel like Ren's the most likely. He's on he's on he's on that sort of risky path. risky path where yeah, I don't know. He mm. might 
not consider anything else like the consequences of iron wood hearing the truth he might just decide there's no point hiding it yeah and the iron wood needs to know absolutely and in the previous episode when he was saying like we don't have time we should be training like it's because he wants to be a part of a movement that is going to stop and defeat salem while he's still young and alive so that he and the rest of his friends can have like a fulfilling adulthood mm. knowing that there's not this overlooming threat of Salem. So, yeah. These, there's a few points I want to touch on. One, I've seen a lot of people saying that this has shown Renora to either be ending or it's unhealthy, a which... Whilst I don't Mm-mm. think I think they need to communicate, I wouldn't say this is the end of Renora at all. Oh no. no, it's the same. It's kind of, well, it's not exactly the same, but obviously, like it's not like relationships don't go go through very rough patches like this. Yeah. It's just this is kind of Renora's really rough patch because Ren is in a very bad place, and it's put mm. their relationship in a very bad place. Yeah, that's the thing about relationships is that they can't always be perfect from like the day you start dating until like the rest of your lives like Mm. there are gonna be some things that show up in your life that are gonna throw curveballs and kind of not destroy the relationship but make things quite hard yeah um so i feel like at the moment it's that kind of like people expect that relationships are always a 50 50 percent split where it's always like each of you are taking half and like supporting the other you know Mm. but sometimes it can be more of like an 80 20 split so right now it's like 80 percent of it's on nora because she wants to talk and she wants to make the relationship work and she just wants to make sure that ren's okay but ren is more focused on something outside of their relationship so he's put more of an importance on that which like that happens sometimes some people put their career before their relationship and that just happens sometimes it doesn't mean Mm. that it's unhealthy or that they can't come back from it it's just a way of life sometimes all the vas kind of gave hints to what we were going to see we got hints that ruby would go off on her own adventure for a few episodes and we've kind of got that especially in Sparks, especially in mm-hmm. um, the other one. We had we had Aaron hint us at a dance, and technically yep. we have had that dance. We did see Blake and Yang mm-hmm. dance. The yep. other big hint... Spot. Yeah. The other big hint we got was MCM Manchester Comic Con. We got Samantha Island say that we're going to get some Nora backstory. And we've heavily it's heavily hinted multiple times, especially with either that she is from Mantle or that she comes from a similar situation to the people in Mantle. Yeah. I get the feeling that is going to be one of the final few episodes and it's what's going to bring her and Ren back together. I think so. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be super sweet. Like the kind of thing where Nora sits Ren down and goes, right, we are going to talk. This is why mm-hmm. I'm doing this. This is why I believe this. The other thing I'd like to say is, um, Ren, you're officially no longer a good boy. You're out. You're in the naughty corner, all right? You're going to sit down. Jean, you've been in there since volume two. You can come back to the table, all right? You can sit here with Oscar and Son. You've been all right. You've been good. You've got a new set of armor. You're looking pretty snazzy. You were nice to everyone. You took people to the movies. You can sit down back at the table. Ren, you were staying in that corner until you apologised to Nora. Is the super nanny making them sit in the naughty step? What yes. <laughs> Jean has finally redeemed himself only for Ren to mess stuff up and I am not happy. Um, wow. Also, can I just point out, where has Jean been? Is John just still at the cinema? Is John just sitting in his room listening to music for the entirety of this episode? Probably. He's mourning the death of the thirsty moms that he cursed. Oh no! Eating really? their casserole while just like crying that he's never gonna have anymore. I mean, it was the mum in the red jacket that gave him the casserole. She's still yeah, but hers alive. is rubbish. She puts broccoli in it and everything. What's wrong with putting broccoli in casserole? It's green. Ew. Uh, this this gif is just it's just your <laughs> casserole he's just crying in his room <laughs> <laughs> oh my god right okay um right on that one i think it's time to end the podcast
Yeah. That was a lot to talk about. Um, as always, <laughs> got to go for everything. But before we finish off, I always ask my guests on the podcast, what things would you like to see from the remaining parts of this volume? And as always, I let the guests pick two things, one shipping thing and one normal thing you'd like to see from the remaining six episodes. So, whichever one of you two would like to go first. For it. I want Salem to show up Ooh. in a very, very spooky fashion, since we now have that tease with that scene of Terry and being broken out of the van. Which is terrifying. Now, <laughs> yeah, now I want to see that happen. I want to see, not exactly mm. the same thing, but I want to see her be spooky witch McGee, that she has all the potential to be, that round. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shippy thing? I mean, y'all know. <laughs> I just want some kind of solid confirmation for Blake and Yang so that we don't have to have another hiatus of suffering. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, less suffering. I would love a Bumblebee kiss. I don't want a I love you yet. No. I no. think it's way too soon for no. an I love you, but it's not too soon for a kiss. Mm. No. Even so, if it's an awkward one. <laughs> even if it's an awkward in the moment ah, one. I didn't mean to, but then like yeah. they both look away and they're like blushing and then we have to I'm gonna go out on a limb yeah. and say it now. I said it last episode. I don't know why. Episode twelve for the bees kiss. It's, I'll hold you to that. Yeah, it we'll is completely it. random why I've gone with this, but I'm going with this, alright? Like and if I turn out right, I am going to go mad. <laughs> This is the hell that you have chosen to die on, is yeah. episode 12. Episode 12, we will be keeping an eye. <laughs> that implies that I haven't already gone mad when the Renora kiss happened, but yo. Anyway, yeah. Senny, your non-shipping moment for this volume that you'd like to see. He'll come back. Because <laughs> I'm such a thirsty hoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to see Neo come back. That's like my main thing. Like, even if it's How just... How do you want her to come back? Well, even if it's just like a little hint. Like, like you said, that it's just like the closing, mm. like, thing of the season. I don't care. I just want to know that she's in Atlas. Mm. That's what I want from it. Um, and my shuppy thing is that I want a bee's kiss. Bees. A bee's kiss. Well, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. We're I'm nearly at the winter break. We've got one more episode left. Of course, we will be back next week once again on the podcast. And of course, my two wonderful guests, the amazing Zhao Long and Seni. You can, of course, find their everyday live, everyday live streams, every weekend live streams of the reactions to the episode. You can find all their content at their respective channels. Could you please give us a quick rundown of where we can find you online? You can get me on Twitter and YouTube at Zhao Long, but on Twitter it's Zhao Long YouTube One. Yeah, and mine probably is better to go up on the screen, but it's at um, <laughs> Lenita Kair oh, <laughs> on Twitter and YouTube and on Instagram, it's Seni underscore XO. I will make sure all are on the screen and in links below. Don't you worry at all. <laughs> Got to say, massive thank you for coming on the podcast, you two. It's been an absolute treat having you here. It was thank fun. So much. It was lovely we to be some part. Great puns, like... Great osmosis. Laughs. I think that's going to stay with me for a while. Osmosis. Yeah. Osmosis. Like, I can't believe that this is m the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. <coughs> anyway. Sorry for killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on one second. I'm coughing. Don't die. <laughs> oh, sorry. That probably made me laugh. Right. I've got to really edit the ending now. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary pals for once again tuning in on the Ruby Radio Podcast. It's been great having you here, and I look forward to seeing you next week. As always, please remember, tag your spoilers, be Ruby, not Salem, and I hope each and every single one of you has an absolutely great day. Goodbye. Bye.